Well, thank you everybody for joining us today for our industry update. We appreciate you taking some time out of your day to get on a webinar with us. Um, Lauren and Zach will be presenting the going ons for this week, the past few weeks. And um, as always, please remember, keep your um, lines muted during the presentation and use the chat feature for any questions and Zach and Lauren will look at those at the end. This is being recorded and we'll be sure to send it out to you uh, via email and it will be posted up on our website. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Zach to introduce everybody. <laughs> well, thank you, Hope, and uh, good morning, everyone. Happy webinar Wednesday. Uh, just a friendly reminder, this webinar is intended for informational purposes for PRLA members and operators throughout the state. It is not intended for the press and is considered off the record. If you are a reporter and you would like to request an interview with PRLA, please feel free to reach out to us and we will work with you to schedule something in the near future. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Zach Pizek. I am the Director of Government Affairs at the PRLA. I'm joined here today uh, by Lauren Brinjak. Uh, Lauren is PRLA's Senior Director of Government Affairs. Lauren and I will be jumping back and forth on various topics uh, this morning. Uh, there are lots, of, lots to cover today and some, some breaking news uh, that we'll get to uh, as well. One big announcement that I kind of wanted to start conversation off with is that many of you probably have seen that the CDC uh, has recently outlined a new set of measures uh, for Americans regarding wearing masks. Uh, and ultimately, they've said that most people do not have to wear masks. And so we're starting to see that message trickle down uh, to the state and local level uh, in certain places. I also uh, uh, you know, I guess with that, it probably seems like a good time to start with some federal updates. And so I'll, ju I'll jump right into it uh, with the State of the Union. Uh, President Biden uh, presented the State of the Union address in front of the Joint Chambers last night. This was President Biden's first State of the Union address. Masks were not required, uh, and we only saw about a handful of masks in the room. This was Biden's first large gathering in public, actually, uh, where we saw the president uh, without without a mask on. He wore a blue tie, uh, so no big surprise there. Uh, it only took about 12 minutes until the president received his first booze, and I was surprised because they were triggered by his mention of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, he called on Congress to pass an increase to the minimum wage, uh, to pass legislation addressing paid leave, uh, and uh, as you can all imagine, those at this point have kind of become obligatory remarks. There's there's no reason to really think that, that these are items that they might move on on the federal level, especially when it comes to uh, the minimum wage paid leave uh, might, might be a different discussion, but nonetheless, we'll always be tracking those issues uh, with our national partners and over at PRLA. Uh, for those who, who might have been watching the over under, the speech came in at about an hour and two minutes long. Uh, the report is that the State of the Union is strong and it's strong because the American people are strong. Uh, and so that's kind of the update there on the State of the Union address. There were a lot of uh, kind of big moments uh, uh, out there uh, regarding uh, Speaker Pelosi and uh, Vice President Harris. And, and I'm sure many of you uh, tuned in. Always happy to answer questions. But I am uh, going to turn it over now to Lauren. Uh, Lauren, what are we hearing in terms of RRF? I did not hear any mention of restaurants uh, in the State of the Union last night. Right. So. Although there has been a bipartisan push for a final round of COVID-19 aid for restaurants and other small businesses, uh, specifically in terms of replenishing the Restaurant Revitalization Fund or the RRF, um, the chances of this happening really are growing slimmer. The best chance for this funding to happen is as part of the fiscal 2022 omnibus package, which Congress uh, needs to pass by uh, March 11th, so that's next week. Congress right now is trying to move quickly on that package, uh, perhaps bringing something to the House floor by uh, March 8th, so early next week. And this is more than likely going to include assistance for Ukraine. And that's kind of the, the big topic that's being worked out right now as they're looking to pass this package. Um, because of that, it's going to be difficult to get other supplemental funding included in the omnibus package, um, like COVID relief, for instance. If the omnibus package is passed without that RRF funding, it's going to be very unlikely that it's going to happen uh, separately, unfortunately. So the best chance for any more COVID relief really is part of this omnibus package, um, but, but the chances really aren't looking great at this point. 
Um, another piece of federal legislation that we're looking at right now is the America Competes Act, and that's HR 4521, and that was passed by the US House last month. And specifically within that piece of legislation, uh, there's a provision uh, that we're looking at which would expand the Seafood Import Monitoring Program or the SIMP. Currently, SIMP focuses on 13 categories of seafood that are deemed to be at high risk for illegal fishing. And companies are already required to keep detailed records on these species. The provision within the America Competes Act would expand uh, SIMP from 1,100 species to cover 13,000 species, and it would impose um, record-keeping requirements on the entire supply chain, so from seafood producers to processors, distributors, restaurants, uh, and retailers. Uh, the issue is that not only will this uh, not prevent illegal fishing, the sheer volume of records and paperwork that this is going to require is going to be uh, unworkable in many instances, and it's also going to translate into increased costs uh, for operators and for consumers. Uh, right now, our partners at the National Restaurant Association are calling on congressional negotiators to use language pertaining to uh, SIMP that was contained in Senate legislation that was passed last year. Um, so they're urging uh, Congress to use that language over the language in this uh, recently passed uh, U.S. House bill. And so this is a piece of legislation that we are going to be uh, continuing to monitor moving forward. Um, moving on to some state issues, I'm going to kick it back to uh, Zach to talk about the, the state of the Pennsylvania legislature right now. Yeah, thank you, Lauren, and, and a great update on the on the SIMP program. I, I added the uh, the one sheet, the one pager kind of informational sheet that the National Restaurant Association had helped produce uh, regarding the issue. I put that in the chat, and if so, if, if, if anyone's interested in getting a little more information on that, uh, check out the chat. In terms of the state updates, so say the legislature, the House and Senate are both technically in recess right now, but they're actually in the midst of budget season with budget hearings coding the calendar. Uh, so this is the time of year where uh, interests and associations and organizations and constituents from all over the state descend on the Capitol and they ask for money um, and, and make their pitch as to why uh, they deserve it the most. Uh, PRLA recently met with Chairman Millard, uh, Majority Chair of the PA House Tourism Committee, to discuss our tourism priorities. As many of you know, uh, some of our top two priorities, uh, one, increasing the line item for tourism funding. Right now, we're sending about $4 million to the tourism office, but we're hoping to get that number closer to $20 million. Two, House Bill 554. This would establish a $15 million uh, grant program for our destination marketing organizations. And I know many of you on this call, including Bob uh, and others, have really helped lately push these tourism priorities. Now is the time to push them with budget season on the horizon. It, it can sometimes be difficult uh, uh, to be heard when there are so many others asking for uh, money with you know, what, what, what they would claim equally valid reasons. And so nevertheless, that's why we met with Chairman Millard. We're keeping these priorities front of mind. That was a very productive discussion that Lauren and I and, and Clinton Madison had uh, from the Greenlee team with the chairman, uh, hoping to keep that conversation going. Also two weeks ago, uh, we recently met with Representative Regina Young. Uh, Regina Young also is a member of the House Tourism Committee. This was, again, to discuss our tourism priorities. Uh, there's, there's a lot of support out there for the increased line item. Uh, most legislators will they say they support House Bill 554. They'll say they support the $20 million line item. Uh, in your advocacy, when you're reaching out to legislators, it's important not just to ask them to support it, but to ask them to go to leadership and to ask them to make a vote, to, to move the bill, to move the legislation um, and, and, to, and to work on next steps. And so uh, that's why we're having these meetings with the House Tourism Committee uh, members, and we'll continue those conversations. Governor Wolf did present his 2022 budget address earlier in February. I do not think uh, we've had a webinar since then. Uh, nothing too unexpected. He did call for an increase to the minimum wage. Like I said, with the State of the Union, at this point, it's almost uh, an obligatory call uh, when it comes to the minimum wage. We're not really expecting there to be an aggressive push on that front this year. I do not think the appetite is there uh, in the PA legislature. 
Uh, tourism is unfortunately, again, being flat funded uh, at that $4 million number, $4 million and, and some change uh, will be heading to the tourism office. Uh, given that they are not in session right now, technically, it's mostly quiet in terms of legislation and legislative priorities. Later in March, Lauren and I will begin scheduling meetings with the four appropriations committee chairs uh, to discuss PRLA's tourism priorities. Our top priorities, again, as they relate to the budget, the increase in the tourism funding, House Bill 554, and then third, which also is on that list, is House Bill 976, uh, which addresses regulations regarding the sh short-term rentals. Uh, so the Department of Labor, uh, also uh, kind of in the, the state update category, the Department of Labor has submitted a final form regulation proposal on changes to the tipped minimum wage and to the tipped wage in general. PRLA, we did submit public comment on all of this. Uh, our remarks uh, and guidance came from our government affairs committee. This was vetted in that committee. Uh, IRC has requested that the department consider aligning with federal code by reference on certain items like the 80-20 rule. And so that was a slight change that we saw. Uh, they are now, again, they were, they, already, they were making the argument that they were aligned with federal code, but there were some public comments that said, well, hey, if you want to align yourself with federal code, just align yourself by referencing it. And so they're going that route when it comes to 80-20. Uh, and they did, however, uh, decide not to adopt the rule regarding the 30-minute threshold. And so many of you know that the 30-minute threshold is, you know, that's part of litigation at the national level. And due to the uncertainty around that litigation, the, the department here in PA has decided not to include uh, the 30-minute threshold in their, their regulations. And so uh, that was something that they left out. Again, due to the pending litigation, we'll keep you posted uh, on that litigation and how that, that all advances at the national level. ERC will be meeting to consider the final rule change on March 21st. Uh, our team uh, will, will be, will be uh, participating in some form, whether it's just attending or perhaps uh, offering remarks at that meeting. Um, and, and then lastly, uh, on the state update, the PA Supreme Court uh, yesterday issued a temporary order uh, reinstating the Commonwealth's broadened mail-in voting laws that were authorized in 2019. And so many of you may recall uh, that they they essentially overturned uh, or, or the Commonwealth Court, uh, they essentially overturned a Commonwealth Court decision that was already made on the subject in February. And so the, the, due to the Supreme Court decision, they are now reinstating uh, the, the mail-in voting laws. And so uh, that could still potentially be playing out. We'll keep you posted. Tune into the daily update uh, if that's a subject you're interested in. And, and like I said, all, all news kind of revolves around the budget hearings uh, up here in Harrisburg. And so going to turn it back over to Lauren uh, Lauren, what are what are we looking at with budget hearings this year? I know we've had a few so far. Yeah, thanks, Zach. So as Zach said, we are right now in the midst of about five weeks of budget-related hearings for the House and Senate Appropriations Committees. And this is the time when the departments within the Wolf Administration come before the Appropriations Committees uh, in both chambers to explain their budget-related requests for the upcoming fiscal year. So because of that, the full House in session, full House and Senate are in session. Uh, the full House will return uh, and session will return to Harrisburg uh, when the budget hearings have concluded at the end of this month. That's going to be on uh, March 21st for the House and uh, March 28th for the Senate. Um, in terms of the appropriations hearings of interest, I think to PRLA members, the Department of Community and Economic Development, DCED, had their budget hearing uh, in the House on February 17th. Um, during that hearing, Representative Millard, who, as Zach mentioned, is chair of the Tourism and Recreational Development Committee, asked, he said, can you talk to us about how the tourism industry is recovering from the pandemic and the governor's business lockdowns? And uh, Secretary Weaver noted that the hospitality industry was hit very hard, but uh, feels that it's coming back. And he noted that he is seeing uh, in the rural areas that it's coming back even uh, more quickly than it is in the urban areas. Uh, so we thought that was very interesting. DCED is going to have its uh, Senate Appropriations Committee hearing uh, later uh, this afternoon, actually. So Zach and I will be uh, paying attention to that uh, to see uh, what comes out of that hearing. Um, moving on a bit, we had our quarterly meeting with the PLCB uh, last month, uh, February 9th. It was a, a good opportunity, as it always is, to continue to build on a, a positive relationship that we're really establishing with the PLCB. 
And during that time, we were able to be proactive in making them aware of some of our legislative priorities uh, for the year. That includes uh, in supporting current legislation regarding uh, liquor privatization, as well as increasing the current licensee discount from 10 to 15%, another one of our priorities this year. Um, we're also interested in expanding the sale of ready to drink cocktails and supporting uh, mixed drinks to go as well. Um, so we talked about all of that. We had a, a very uh, positive meeting with that group. As uh, Zach kind of alluded to, legislative activity at the state level really is going to pick up quite a bit later this spring when the House and Senate come back into session and as they're looking to negotiate a budget to pass by June 30th. So I think we're, we're certainly going to have many more state legislative updates for all of you in the, uh, the coming weeks and months and, and we'll probably be uh, very busy as we get into uh, April and especially May and June. I wanted to move on a bit to some of what we are working on at the local level. Um, in Pittsburgh right now, there is legislation calling for a ban on most single use plastic bags. This was reintroduced to Pittsburgh City Council uh, at the beginning of this year. It was originally introduced last November by Councilwoman Erica Straussberger, but the City Council wanted some additional time to address stakeholder comments and uh, stakeholder concerns. So the legislation was held over for a couple of months and reintroduced this year. Um, if passed, it would ban uh, almost all single use plastic bags and it would implement a fee for paper bags. And, and this proposed measure is pretty similar to one that is in place in Philadelphia already. PRLA has voiced some concerns about the effect that this is going to have on our operators who rely heavily on takeout and delivery and have come to do so uh, even more throughout the pandemic. We recently participated in a, a working group meeting hosted by Councilwoman Strasburger, and we're actually going to have our own uh, independent meeting with her next week where we're going to uh, continue the conversation on that uh, proposal. Uh, on the good news front, Pittsburgh City Council last month uh, unanimously approved a bill that will allow restaurants to continue using sidewalks and streets for outdoor dining. This bill was signed uh, by Mayor Ed Ganey on February 17th. We strongly advocated in support of the bill uh, as being a vital part of restaurant recovery in the city. The new ordinance takes effect 30 days after being signed, so uh, later this month. And the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure currently is working to develop rules and regulations to implement this new ordinance and for the issuance and enforcement of uh, what are going to be new annual licenses. So we are monitoring the development of those rules and regulations, um, and, and we'll certainly get involved in those if we need to. In the meantime, the good news is that operators can continue using uh, their outdoor dining setups under their current uh, temporary permits. Um, so now I'm going to uh, kick things back to Zach for an update on some of our uh, Philadelphia-specific initiatives. Thanks, Lauren. Really happy to hear the news, too, about outdoor dining in Pittsburgh. Great work on that issue. And thank you to Allison Harnden, uh, who oftentimes, I don't know if she's on the call today, but oftentimes joins these calls. And, and she's, she's done terrific work uh, uh, making sure that the industry and our concerns have been recognized uh, when, when they've been uh, uh, working up uh, uh, that program. And also Mike Mitchum, our, uh, our, our Western chapter uh, president. And uh, We've officially now, uh, it looks like there are permanent programs uh, outdoor dining wise here coast to coast uh, <clears throat> in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia and, uh, and Pittsburgh. So great news. In Philly, I wanted to start with the, the, the food establishment, um, the food establishment vaccine mandate about a week after a meeting that we had with the Department of Public Health, where PRLA requested that they end the vaccine mandate and more specifically that they draw up some numbers uh, that kind of link hard standards uh, to whatever algorithm it is that they're using to determine mitigation efforts. About a week after that meeting, the city did announce uh, that they would be ending the indoor dining vaccine mandate. And so with that, they rolled out uh, four new categories of, of kind of risk level. And these are levels that the Philadelphia Department of Health will use to identify how much risk the community is at of spreading COVID-19. 
And so you've got about four categories. Uh, and, and, and so the, the update today was going to be that, that restaurants no longer have to impose that, that vaccine mandate um, and, and could just do, we were in the mask only phase. But breaking news just this morning that as of today, the metrics have dropped enough that the health department is moving the city to the all clear phase. Uh, so the all clear phase as of today, March 2nd is in place. That means that businesses like restaurants, hotels in Philadelphia no longer have to enforce not only the Mac vaccine mandate, but the mass mandate either. Um, and so again, businesses, restaurants, hotels, uh, many of our travel and tourism partners, you no longer have to enforce the mass mandate or the vaccine mandate. Um, you may be asking, will, will, will there be some businesses uh, that keep the vaccine mandate or keep uh, the mask order, that is up to the business or the institution. Uh, you, you, the city did clarify that you are allowed to have more strict guidance uh, than the city's response if you choose to. Uh, so there may still be some businesses that decide to require proof of vaccine or that everyone wears a mask, but nevertheless, it is not required anymore. And again, this only relates to businesses, uh, schools and hospitals um, and in and, and places where, where uh, folks and guests may be more vulnerable, um, the, the, this does not apply to them. So the all clear category for restaurants, for businesses starts today. And so that's great news uh, coming out of Philadelphia. Uh, in terms of outdoor dining uh, in, in Philly, a couple of weeks ago, the Streets Department posted proposed regulations for Philadelphia's outdoor dining program. Since then, Ben and I and Lauren and Andrew from Philly, we've been collecting feedback from operators. Uh, our goal is to schedule a meeting with the city to ask for some changes to be made based off of the feedback we received. And so we just scheduled that meeting with the streets department for tomorrow morning. This is an informal meeting uh, to, to, to sort of request uh, maybe some changes be addressed, but at the very least, we want to uh, we want to highlight and identify what our top concerns are. And, and, and again, we we need your feedback. And so if you have any guidance or any uh, any uh, just feedback in general that you'd like to send to us on the outdoor dining program, please feel free to send that to me or to Ben or to Lauren. I'll make sure I put my email in the chat and we'll be taking all of those items uh, to the streets department in that meeting tomorrow. Our goal is to hopefully have some of the concerns addressed in that meeting. We still have time to request a public hearing on the regulations if we'd like to. We have up until March 11th to make that request. The problem with requesting a public hearing is that it will delay the implementation of the regulations. And so no new streeteries uh, would be approved uh, and also current streeteries might no longer be compliant uh, with state regulations. And so nevertheless, uh, many have expressed concerns um, and we're hoping to have those concerns addressed, but in a way that that doesn't require that we that we request a hearing. But we will see because there are a lot of concerns coming in, specifically as it relates to the sixty thousand dollars security bond. For instance, uh, there would be a twenty two hundred dollar annual license fee. Uh, that that this is a new fee. Uh, we're concerned that might keep a lot of independent and smaller restaurants out of the mix. That's something we don't want to see, um, and we don't want that to be the case. And so uh, there are a couple other concerns as well like having to remove the structures for inclement weather, what, you know, inclement weather is often uh, forecasted quite frequently. So we're going to see what that's defined as. We're also going to continue collecting feedback from all of you. Uh, and so again, feel free to email Ben or I or Lauren or anybody on the PRLA team with any concerns that you have uh, regarding the outdoor dining program. And we'll make sure that we take those concerns uh, to the city on your behalf. Also in Philadelphia, COVID-19 sick leave. Council Member Brooks recently introduced a bill that addresses COVID-19 paid sick leave. Uh, this was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, PRLA has had a few meetings with Council Member Brooks. In this bill, employer is defined with the exclusion now to only to employers who employ less than 10 employees, which is different than the last version that had that threshold set at 50 employees. Uh, for employees who work 40 hours or more per week, COVID-19 leave shall be provided in the amount of 40 hours unless the employer already designates a higher limit. And I think the generous employer threshold is now at 112.5 hours. Uh, an employer is not required to change an existing leave policy or provide additional paid leave to employees. Again, if that policy already meets that generous time off threshold. Uh, after a few conversations with council, specifically with council member Brooks, uh, we have successfully had the bill amended to include a higher threshold. So we lifted that 10 employee threshold 
to 25 employees instead of the 10. And so that there are about 3000 businesses that were that will, this will no longer comply with, but there are still about three to 4,000 businesses in Philadelphia that do have between 25 and 50 employees. And so we're continuing our conversations with council member Brooks. We are still asking that they revert back to the prior version of this legislation, which again had the threshold set at 50 employees. Uh, and so we'll keep you posted on that as conversations uh, continue. That second meeting with council member Brooks was yesterday and PRLA also launched a call to action. So if you operate in Philadelphia and if you have more than 25 employees, but less than 50 employees, uh, that call to action is something that you might want to consider. And we'd encourage you to reach out to council to express your concerns about the legislation. Uh, next up, uh, Lauren and I want to review some FYIs. Uh, so to start things off here, the PRLA 2022 legislative roundtables have officially kicked off. Uh, PRLA hosted its first 2022 legislative roundtable event with the Western chapter members yesterday on Tuesday in Pittsburgh. Uh, we had more than uh, 10 representatives and senators and staff attend. It was a great event. Uh, thank you to the legislators who were able to participate in that. And a big thank you to our Western chapter for your engagement and for your enthusiasm. Uh, they noted a few times uh, at the meeting, they, they love talking to Lauren and I, uh, but they, they love even more hearing from all of you. Um, and so it's important that, that when, these, when these roundtables come to your area, uh, we'd encourage you to participate if you're able to. Uh, the next legislative roundtable event will be the Bucksmont chapter on March 31st. Um, and so we'll be including additional information on that event and future events uh, in the daily update and on this webinar in the near future. So an update to the PA tourism study. PRLA commissioned a tourism study uh, back in 2015, 2016. This was a, a study conducted by Adam Sachs at, of Oxford Economics, uh, some of the most credible researchers in the industry. That report found, no surprise to many of our tourism partners on the call today, that there is a three to one return on investment for every dollar spent on tourism in Pennsylvania. In other words, it is a revenue generator. And uh, as we work on advocating for an increase in the budget for our tourism promotion, uh, the policy committee, along with the PRLA board support, has decided that it's time to update that study, uh, mostly because we've, we've seen uh, unprecedented investments uh, throughout the pandemic from ARPA funding in places like Arizona, who invested $100 million plus in the Visit Arizona initiative in Virginia, uh, in California, in New York. And so it would be interesting to see data on how all of that is, 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 is playing out. And so we're going to work with Adam to get a better idea of what sort of revenue tourism can generate for the state. And that, that, that data is going to now be based on uh, updated numbers and, and research that we've seen uh, based on 2019, 2020, 2021 numbers. Uh, and we also want to look at how tourism was, was impacted during the pandemic more specifically related to mental health, uh, because we know uh, that there are a lot of people who took advantage of tourism in Pennsylvania and the great at outdoors uh, to get out more and to deal with anxiety and depression um, and to help get through the pandemic. And so it would be interesting to see if there's any data or research um, that we can produce specifically uh, on that subject. So we're very excited uh, to get to work on this study. Uh, we're hoping to finalize all of that by May of 2022 so that uh, Lauren and I and our members can, can use the updated study uh, to, to continue our budget push and, and advocate for some of our tourism priorities this year. Uh, and so we will keep everyone updated uh, on that subject. Uh, next up on my list here is the county ARP money, the county ARP money that is available. Just an FYI, uh, we have heard from some counties uh, and some from, from some of our tourism partners uh, that, that some counties have started administering and appropriating that ARP money or have at least committed to funding certain tourism projects at the local level. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that every county is moving at their own pace and they're all at, you know, all 67 of them are moving at different paces, unfortunately. And so it's not clear where some are, uh, but we do know that there are some that have committed to funding projects already. And so as we get more information on that, we'll, we'll keep all of you updated. Some of you, especially our DMOs, uh, have been very interested in this subject. And so if, if I'd ask all of you, if you have heard from your county in one way or the other on what they plan to do with this funding and what their next steps are, Lauren and I would love to hear from you so we can kind of collect that data and get that information 
uh, out to uh, the rest of the membership. That's really it on ARP money. And then Lauren, I'll turn it back over to you uh, for an update on the new maps that we're seeing. Sure. So one of the hot topics all year politically, of course, is going to be the upcoming elections. We now have a new congressional map for Pennsylvania, courtesy of the PA Supreme Court. Uh, last week in a four to three decision, they chose a map called the Carter Plan uh, that was proposed by Democratic plaintiffs. Um, so that map is currently in place. However, the newest update uh, in this saga is that a group, uh, including a pair of Republican candidates uh, for Congress, uh, this past Monday submitted an emergency application for a writ of injunction. And they have taken this to the US Supreme Court and they're asking the court to uh, stop the implementation of this new congressional map. So this sort of drama is still playing out. And I'm sure we'll have some uh, future updates on, on what transpires, but for right now, uh, we do have a current uh, new map uh, for Congress in Pennsylvania um, that is not uh, terribly different from the past map, although Pennsylvania did lose uh, one congressional seat uh, this year. So we go from uh, 18 to 17. At the state level then, new maps were approved by the Legislative Reapportionment Commission. Um, and that's a five person panel and it's composed of General Assembly leaders and an independent chair. Um, those maps were approved. The Senate map was approved without much fuss. Um, most agreed on that. It was the House version of these maps that has draw, drawn um, adamant opposition from the Republicans. The uh, new maps are still within the 30-day period uh, for court challenges, um, during which the state Supreme Court will hear arguments from people who have raised legal issues. Um, and, and so, those maps have not been finalized yet. They will be shortly. When that does happen, uh, we're probably going to see more announcements from current incumbents, um, more retirements as people decide whether they want to run in their new district, whether they are pitted against another incumbent uh, with, where districts have been combined. So we're, we're probably going to, to see a lot more information about who's all running for re-election, who's not. Um, and so Zach and I are kind of keeping track of this with interest. Uh, so we kind of know what we're going to be uh, working on later this spring. I would also, uh, switching gears a bit, like to mention the National Restaurants Association's upcoming public affairs conference that's in Washington, D.C. this spring. And I'd really like to encourage anyone who's interested to attend with us. It's a very important event, helps to shape our future federal legislation affecting the restaurant industry. Uh, this year, it takes place April 25th through 27th at the Grand Hyatt in Washington, D.C. We are back to a fully in-person event after a couple years of uh, virtual meetings. Uh, and here at our office, we're going to be working to schedule meetings with the Pennsylvania congressional delegation. Um, so we're really hoping to get as many uh, PRLA members to join us as possible. If you're interested in more information, I'm going to put the registration link in the chat box, or if you email me or Zach, we are more than happy to sort of provide you with uh, some additional details on that conference. Um, and then the last uh, bit of news I wanted to note, as you may have seen, uh, the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board this past Sunday, acting at the direction of Governor Tom Wolf, ordered that all Russian vodkas be pulled from the shelves of the state stores in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Additionally, we've heard that uh, Pennsylvania Treasurer Stacey Garrity has pulled nearly $3 million in Pennsylvania investments in Russian holdings. And this was supported by the legislature as well. On the decision, uh, the treasurer was quoted as saying, we know that every dollar matters and we have to uh, protect the taxpayers and uh, stand with Ukraine. So, so there's definitely been a, a united front uh, around some of these actions uh, over the past few days. Um, I think Zach and I touched on a lot of different issues today. Um, we're going to continue to update you on all of these as they unfold over the next uh, few weeks and months. If you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat for us and we're, we're happy to answer them. And uh, thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna uh, turn things over to Hope. 
Thank you, Zach and Lauren. I um, just want to talk a little bit about some upcoming events that are happening. Um, we will be having our last installation dinner on Monday for the Brandywine chapter. So please come out if you have the time. Um, these have been really great events, getting back together with our members. Um, we do have some virtual meetings coming up, talking about hiring and thinking outside the box. So please pay attention to our calendar on our website. You can register for these events to get the Zoom links because um, they are virtual. And then at the end of this month, I think we did talk a little bit about it, um, but there is a DMO retreat and advocacy um, boot camp. Um, our registration is up on our website. So please check out the events that are happening on Monday and Tuesday. And if you're interested, um, register and come on out for the boot camp. Our next page. Just wanted to remind everybody about the comprehensive training options with SurfSafe. Um, as always, we have SurfSafe manager certification classes going on across the state. You can go to our calendar to register. If you have any questions, you can definitely give me a call. Surf Success was, uh, is a new program, a newer program that they have launched with um, training packages for your supervisors to um, get additional training um, and some career development um, paths that you can create. Surf Safe Workplace has two really great programs. One is preventing um, sexual harassment and, and the other is an understanding unconscious bias at the workplace. These are both online programs that are great ways to increase your training op opportunities for your employees. Um, they take about 60 minutes and the cost is minimal. So please check out our website for that. Scholarship program is still open. Please market this to individuals that are looking for high school students or college grads or individuals in your um, organizations that are looking to go back to get pursue post-secondary education. Um, we are still accepting them. The application is available through a link on our website and actually applications are due April 1st. Any questions though, please refer them to me and I can help them out. And next slide. Lastly, I just wanted to highlight our post-art competition that happened last week. It was great. We got over 60 students together with over 30 judges in um, the Penn Stater with, with our students showing us their skills on the culinary side and showing us their skills on the management side. We will be taking Milton Hershey School for Culinary and Crawford County CTC's um, team for management to the National Pro Students um, Invitational, which is being held in DC on um, May 6th through the May 8th. So if you wanna get more information about that, we'd love to have Pennsylvania um, contingency down there to support our teams as they um, go against the other states. It was a really exciting day, a lot of energy and a lot of um, just seeing the students back in person was wonderful. So um, I hope everybody that helped um, found it in, as enjoyable as I did. And I wanna thank everybody for their support of this event. And with that, our next webinar will be on March 16th. So please join us. We do have the link up on our website. And I know Zach and Lauren have been answering questions throughout, but I don't know if you guys just wanna just follow up on any of the um, responses you've put up. Yeah, sure, we, we can go through a few of them, Hope, thank you. Um, I, I saw Rose, you mentioned, uh, what is the house bill number for the DMO grant program? And for, for Rose and those out there who, who need house bill 554, uh, that was introduced by Representative Rader, uh, and it's it's currently still in the, the House Tourism Committee, but it is one of our top priorities in terms of lodging and tourism uh, for, for 2022. Uh, we added some updated uh, legislative talking points uh, to the chat. We also added the leave behind. Bob, I think you asked how broadly may we share the leave behind. Feel free to share the leave behind uh, with anyone you think uh, would find it helpful and resourceful. Uh, it's, it's initially intended for legislators, and so it's something we provide as a one sheet to legislators um, at, uh, at our legislative roundtables. Uh, but nevertheless, feel free to share, with, share it with members and, and other operators throughout the state as well. Uh, in terms of the issue talking points, uh, those are something that, you know, we do share those with legislators sometimes, but they're quite comprehensive. And, and I think they're about nine or 10 pages long. And so, um, you know, if you wanted to share them, if somebody asked for them, feel free. Uh, there's nothing in there that they, they couldn't see for any reason. But uh, it's just a, it's a longer document. And, and, and the leave behind is kind of a synopsized version of that. So um, those are updated to reflect our 2022 legislative priorities. And so that's why we added them uh, to the chat in terms of the Brandywine uh, legislative roundtable event that will be on Tuesday, November 29th. Very excited for that to see you and, and the Brandywine chapter again, Bob. That was a great event last year and uh, looking forward uh, to the one this year. 
And let's see, I don't know, Lauren, I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I don't know if we're missing anything. I think we might have covered all the questions uh, here, but Lauren and I have both added our emails to the chat. And so feel free to contact either of us if, if PRLA can be, can be helpful on any of these, these issues moving forward. But um, covered a lot today, a lot of breaking news, especially in Philadelphia, especially in Pittsburgh. Um, but again, always feel free to reach out to us if we can be helpful. So thank you all uh, for joining us. And I guess we will see you next on Wednesday, March 16th at 11 a.m. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.